Welcome to Calvary Temple Church, here in the heart of downtown Winnipeg. Calvary Temple is people, people of all generations and all nations. Stay tuned for a message of hope and encouragement. Today's message in a series on Journey to the Cross. I am sure in one way or another, we've all been victimized by someone's bait and switch, promising you one thing and giving you something very different. Has that ever happened to you? In our sermon today, what's your agenda? We ask the question. Many a painful lesson has been learned by suffering through someone's hidden agenda. Over the years, as I've pastored now for almost 40 years, I know that at times things like this happen where a couple that's new to the church will be invited over to a person's house for fellowship. We see you're new, you're lonely, you want to fit into the church, come to our house. And when they get there, an employment opportunity is offered to them in a, in a room filled with all kinds of other people and projectors and graphs and all kinds of stuff. It's called hidden agenda, not being up front, not being honest about what I really, I said I wanted to get to know you and have fellowship, and what I really wanted to do was sell you something. Well, today we catch up to Jesus on his journey to the cross. Now, it's called Holy Week, and it begins on Palm Sunday, and it seems on Palm Sunday in the Bible that everybody is on Jesus' agenda. It seems like everybody's with him, and they're all singing Hosanna, and everything's wonderful, and he's going into Jerusalem on the colt, but <laughs> things are not as they seem. In just a very few hours, a few days, the Hosannas turned to something very different. Because there were people all along the way that had a hidden agenda. They were up to something else. And so um, I just want to state that in our story and sometimes in our lives, everyone has an agenda. Everyone. You know what I mean. Has this ever happened to you? You're talking to someone and they're not listening because you can tell they're thinking about what they're going to say the minute you stop talking because they got an agenda. And the truth is that when they start to talk, it's hard for me to listen because I'm waiting to tell them what I need to tell them. And so we both have our separate agendas going on and no one's really listening. Well... There are four individuals today that we're going to look at. And in the conversations that they have with Jesus in this journey to the cross, it is obvious that they are not listening to Jesus. They are carrying out their own agenda. And actuality, in a human sense, now we know that God was up to something, and God, the, the whole crucifixion and all of that, was not an accident and it wasn't a conspiracy that somehow got by God. God was in it. But in a human sense, my friends, do you know that what happened on the cross was a culmination of these individuals' hidden agenda? It was a culmination. So I hope you will find it interesting today and even for the children that are present here this morning as we talk about Four different people and four different agendas in front of us today. Number one, the Judas agenda. And the best word to sum that up is greed. The Judas agenda, greed. Now, it's amazing how little we know about this man named Judas Iscariot. Think about what you know about him. We know that he betrayed Jesus, and we know that he tragically took his own life. We know those two things. 
Now, there are theories that people have. Some people say that Judas did what he did because he thought Jesus wasn't moving quickly enough to bring in the kingdom, and he wanted to boot those Romans out, so he was going to push Jesus' hand. He didn't mean to really betray Jesus in that. He wanted to get Jesus motivated, so he got him in the thick of things, and he expected Jesus to just rise up and kill everybody. There are those who think that. There are those who would say that no, he knew exactly what he was doing. Well, in the gospel accounts, we get little glimpses of what was really the agenda of Judas. Let's watch it together. One of his disciples, this is John, and John's a great storyteller. He paints colorful pictures who was later to betray him, objected. Now, I want to just tell you where we are in John 12. We're in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, sometimes in the Scripture, we get those Marys mixed up. Well, this is Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and she had poured some perfume on Jesus. She anointed him prior to him being buried, prior to him going to the cross, she was so overwhelmed by her love for him that she got this expensive perfume out and she anointed him. Well, listen to Judas. Now John's writing this, eh? Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Now that sounds like his agenda. But that wasn't his agenda. It was worth a year's wages. And John puts in a little commentary. He says, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Woo! Here's one on the road that Jesus was on, on his way to the cross. And he had an agenda, and it was all about greed. It was all about what's in it for me, and what can I get? Well, you talk about incrimination. I'm, I wouldn't want to be written up in the Gospels like that, would you? Wow. And John lays it out. And here's a man who's appearing to be a defender of the poor. Wow, he's concerned about widows and orphans. But his real motive isn't that at all. That's just a, a hidden agenda. You know, nothing much has changed. <laughs> For those who are regulars here at Calvary Temple recently, and you can pick up this series, it was called Toxic. But we talked a few weeks ago about toxic religion. And you know what? It's no different than what Judas did right there. I am so concerned. Why was that money spent? Not spent on the poor. Oh, my, my, my. And all the time, people involved in toxic religion are taking it for themselves and not giving to the poor at all. And it's so much a part of our world today. The Judas greed agenda. And sorry to say, it is thriving in our Western world. And it doesn't get any better, actually. Then if we go and look at another little gospel writer, and he kind of gives us a little insight into Judas. One of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot. By the way, we don't really know what Iscariot means. Scholars disagree completely on what it means. He went to the chief priest, to the religious leaders of the day, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? Referring to Jesus. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty crass, isn't it? How much money is in this for me? I'll sell out for, uh, oh, okay, 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Do you know what was going on in Judas' life? Greed was running his life selfishness, self-will. He was not concerned about anything or anybody but himself. 
He used to help himself to the funds. What's in it for me? What can I steal for myself? Can you imagine if in your biography, if someone wrote about your life and they said those two things? He used to take from the treasury and he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Can you imagine? And that's what his life was about. Well, self-centeredness, my friends, opens us to graver dangers. This greed, this underlying motivation of his life made him susceptible to more. You know what Martin Luther's definition of sin was? And I found this to be very interesting. Here's what Martin Luther used to say. Sin is the heart curved in on itself. (laughs) The heart run wild with selfishness. The heart only concerned about itself. So what happened? Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot. Watch the progression. Self, 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 self. Me, 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 me. My agenda, my agenda, my agenda. For me, for me, for me. And then Satan says, okay, you've played right into my hand. The devil didn't make him do it. He chose, and the devil took advantage. And by his agenda, by his self-will, and what a, what a definition, sin is the heart curved in on itself. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Wow. Judas, agenda greed. Let's move along and meet a couple, three more people on this road to the cross. Caiaphas. Well, his agenda was stability or the status quo or playing it safe, you might say. Now, you need to understand that he was a religious leader. And in that day, they were kind of pseudo-religious political. They they had alignments in both camps. And uh, you know what his motto in life was? Don't rock the boat. Take, take her cool. Don't, don't rock the boat. Because at this moment in his life, Caiaphas is on the top of the mountain, the, the, the political, religious mountain leadership. He's on the top. And how many know when you're on the top, you fight real hard to stay there? And that's what he's up to. He's not interested in truth. He's interested in keeping the peace, keep everything safe, don't get me in trouble with the Roman government, let's everything just be neat here. Do you know what status quo the meaning is? Well, status quo is Latin for the mess we're in. And he knows he's in a mess. And he just doesn't know what to do and he wants to keep it safe. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus for they were afraid of the people. So here's a man who's motivated by keeping things the way they were. Don't rock the boat. Play it safe. I want things to remain as they are. Boy, we're into protecting ourselves. When the opportunity comes, siding with people that are against the Lord and to don't, don't rock the boat. Don't, don't get in trouble. You know, there were um, people hundreds of years ago who rocked the boat when it came to slavery. And they said, this is not right. And they paid the price. Well, there are people today who are standing up and talking about human trafficking. And they're courageous enough to talk about it out loud. I had someone just this week tell me that 
all of this fuss about human trafficking. Make, make the people themselves responsible. Oh, my heart broke. Don't, don't bother me with, with difficult stuff. I don't want to listen to difficult stuff. The sanctity of human life the protection, the human rights of mothers and fathers and unborn children. Oh, don't, don't, don't rock the boat. Do you know what fear does? Fear pushes us to do the unthinkable. Now, this is a religious leader. Listen to me, friends. Caiaphas. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, spoke up. He said, you know nothing at all. You do not realize. Talking to the crowd, it's better for you if this one man, this Jesus, dies for the people than that the whole nation get in trouble with Rome. <laughs> so let's just eliminate him. I'm not interested in truth. I want the easy way out. I don't want to be fussing about stuff that gets me in trouble. Too much discomfort to have Jesus hanging around. Let's, let's get rid of him. I, I don't, I don't want to know about 12-year-old girls in Cambodia. Don't bother me with facts. I don't want to hear about that. Mm. I'm so glad that uh, Jesus uh, cares about the truth. And this man, on his agenda, he wasn't interested in the truth. He was interested in saving his own hide. He was interested in keeping things calm. He was interested in the Romans looking favorably on him, and he didn't want to cause any trouble. Well, can we talk a little bit about the third person? I wonder who that might be. Well, his name was Pilate. Now, you say Caiaphas and Pilate, aren't they? The no. Caiaphas was the religious guy, and Pilate was the Roman guy. He was the governor. He was, do you know why he was sent to Judea to be the governor? Because he had been demoted. He had got himself in trouble in the last place he was governor, and so they banished him to the Judean people because they were always causing trouble, and you think you've had it bad, you wait till you get to Judea and cope with all those fighting people. So there he was, Pilate. And do you know what his deal was? To stay in power and get out of Judea as soon as he could and get back to some place of meaningful clout in his life. So this man who longs for power, longs for power, to stay in power, and he says to Jesus, Right in John's Gospel, chapter 19, do you refuse to speak to me? Can you hear them? You know, sometimes people who speak really loudly are very insecure. <laughs> and he speaks loudly. Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus looked at him and said, <laughs> You have no power over me unless it's given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no longer a friend of Caesar, and you're going to have to stay in Judea forever. <laughs> You'll never get that promotion you're after. And Caesar won't like you. And they appeal to his grasp for power, and he wants to fix it. And they said, anyone who claims to be opposed 
is, claims to be a king, king of the Jews, opposes Caesar. And they played him like a fiddle. And he becomes afraid of the Jewish mob that's there that night. You're no friend of Caesar. Have you noticed how fear causes us to rationalize? Boy, oh boy, oh boy. You know what he does? He flogs Jesus. He offers them Barabbas. He sends him off to Herod. He's just hoping above all, I need to get rid of this problem because I need to stay in power. And notice Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, he said. (laughs) You say that I'm a king, Jesus answered. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify that the truth, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews, gathered them there. I find no basis for a charge against him. And then notice what he did. Insecurity causes us to rationalize. And Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Here's a man who was so concerned about power, about holding on to power, about getting promoted back out of Judea, that he actually sold Jesus out and said, my skin is more important than truth, and you can have him and do whatever you like. Wow. It's amazing how we squirm on an inconvenient truth. Some of you may recognize the term inconvenient truth. I wonder how Al Gore feels about the winter of 2014. Anyway, that's not him. Shouldn't have said that. Um, Hang on to human power at all costs. And he missed the source of real power. Jesus, the creator, God, was standing in front of him and had all power and all authority. And he caved into the crowd. Wow. He was too self-consumed with his own power to, to figure that Jesus was there. The final person with a hidden agenda. The Herod agenda. The Herod agenda. Now, This is the one that he sent Jesus to. I I, I don't know if you've read this before, but this guy was all about... Now, we're not sure if he was a seeker or a skeptic. You, You judge. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he'd been wanting to see him. He'd heard about his interviews on CNN and all of that. From when he heard about him, what did he want? I want to know the truth. No. He hoped to see him perform some kind of sign of some sort. He wanted to see a miracle. He wanted to to see if this guy was really as amazing as they said he was. Show me your stuff, Jesus. Now, I don't know how many hippies we have here from the 60s and 70s, but I got a hunch there are some here. Do you remember in Jesus Christ Superstar that line when Herod, it's kind of, it's a musical. And I won't try to tackle the tune, okay? I'll save you that. Walk across my swimming pool, turn some water into wine, That's all you need to do. Come on, king of the Jews. What was that about? Mocking. Skeptic. Come on, give me a little sign here, Jesus. I want you to know, friends, Jesus doesn't need to prove himself to anyone. He is who he is. And this man wanted to see a little show. 
See, pride of intellect prevents us from perceiving the truth. And Herod, he plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. And Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him and dressed him in an elegant robe, and they sent him back to Pilate. Boy, oh boy. They were skeptics. They were not open to even wanting to know the truth. Do you know that I meet people all the time who are kind of like Herod? I, I meet people who are pouting at God that are on strike. I'm going to stop going to church. I'm going to stop tithing. I'm going to, God isn't coming through for me. Show me a sign, Jesus. Walk on my swimming pool. Turn some water into wine. Ah. Well, Jesus is not moved by our hidden agendas. You can't fool Jesus. <laughs> Aren't you glad? You can't say, oh, that money should have been used for the poor. And if you're stuffing it in your jeans, God knows all about it. Wow. He is not moved by our personal agendas. Jesus will not contradict our personal agendas. He will not interfere. Do you know that Matthew says that Jesus could have called 10,000 angels down and impressed Pilate right out of his socks? You want power, Pilate? I'll show you power. He didn't bite. He said, Pilate, I'm standing right in front of you. I'm the son of God. I'm born of a virgin. And if you're not going to believe, I'm not sending anybody to help. And finally, you must, I must, set my agenda aside to truly connect with Jesus. Greed, power, pride, all of those things. You know what the word is today? Humility. Acceptance. Get on Jesus' agenda and serve him with all your heart. Amen? Amen. Thank you for watching the broadcast. An audio recording of today's message is available simply for the asking. Write, email, or call our toll-free number and request it by the CD offer shown on the screen. Our program is viewer-supported. It is people like you who help pay for the airtime. Thank you for your continued giving. We look forward to hearing from you. Please join us again next week for another episode of Calvary Temple Church. God bless you.